All right, we are live. Um, okay, so I'm I'm hearing a bit of an echo there in the background. Do you have? Turn it down. Hang on, I'll turn it down. Go there, ahead. that's better. Okay, that's better. Yeah, good. Okay, let me go and check and see where our chat. Get our chat all set up here. Mm -hmm. We'll let some people join in. Okay, we got 10 people in there. Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm just going to monitor the chat here. Okay. There we go. Okay. Everybody in the chat, if anybody in the chat can just let us know if you can see us and hear us okay. We've got our issues uh, sorted out with uh, technical problems there. We're going to have a bit of a shorter one today just because the time has gone on here. And we apologize we weren't able to come on it a little bit earlier. But we are now here. We have Michael here. Uh, Michael, if you want to say hello to people. Hi, everyone. Nice to be with you. Sorry for all the delays. Great. OK, yeah, we got it. Everybody hears us perfect. Excellent. All right, so Michael. As we're waiting for people to join us, I know we're going to have some uh, questions coming in, but I wanted to ask you, in light of a lot of the material we've been covering on the Unslaved podcast and what we see happening right now, where we've got all this technology coming out, and you've done so many, so much work on the subject uh, called posthumanism. You did a talk called posthumanism, and it's the idea of you look at this not just from the technological point of view, but more from the psychological point of view. Like where where is humanity psychologically? And is is one of the reasons we're pushing further and further into an inorganic mode of existence, more of, with all this artificial intelligence and giving up what it truly means to be human for this synthetic cybernetic world, is that linked to ancient trauma? Is that linked to the past shock theory and i wanted to maybe talk a little bit about that subject and then we'll pull some questions for people but what are your first thoughts on that i think that's it because remember ancestral trauma is, is the secret of it all if you follow all the threads of pathology you'll come back to that anyway and so yeah it's it's uh remember the cities we live in and the, the families we grew up in are pretty artificial anyway so you don't need a bunch of post-humanists running around you know with an agenda an overt Agenda, agenda based in the brain's just a computer, the universe is just a machine. Half of what you are as a human being is non conscious. You even admit that yourself. You don't control your heartbeat, you don't control your neurons firing, you don't turn them on and off every day, uh, you know, off at night. Uh, you don't uh, monitor your skin temperature. You know, you're, you're non conscious of pretty much 80% of what you're doing. So, why tell us that you're not a machine? And then whatever is the 20% left, they'll say even 10, 15% of that is automatic because you're following the consensus of the crowd. You're not making your own decisions. And you know something? They're right. So they've been able to manifest billions because ideologically, you know, uh, uh, the human race is not showing them that they're wrong. And when the human race then, and of course, to tenderize them, tenderize us, hey, under the Christmas tree, you got another iPhone. Under, you know, you got another tablet, you got another. So we're being tenderized through all of the technology, which is not evil in itself, but it is if it's in the hands of psychopaths who are trying to enslave your beinghood. But connected to what you're asking is you bet we have manifested that. We manifest all evil. That's, that's the, you know, the Michael Desarian message. It's not about anybody, you know, putting an Orwellian boot in your face. We've called all the pathologies into being. They wouldn't even exist. We've called it into being because... Being human is tough. Like T.S. Eliot said, we can't take too much reality. We try it and we don't like it. We come out of the womb, we go through the Oedipus complex, we become teenagers. And by the time we're 21, and certainly by 27, you know, the famous Saturn return, we're done. We're done with life. We're done with a hassle. If life was just nothing but recreation, uh, you know, merry-go-rounds, hey, probably, you know, we would be, 
we, we still say, okay, but it's not. It's full of teenage trauma and teenage angst and letdowns and breakups and material want and job losses and existential, you know, disconnects and feelings of impotency about, oh, the political situation, here's little old me, I can do nothing except put an X on a box for some other psychopath, right? So by the time you reach 30, you're in a pretty much melted down state existentially. And then when these people promise you the ability to, you know, to, uh, as soon as you open the door of your house, all the music will start and the, the droid will come over and ask you, you know, do you want a blowjob or would you just, you know, like a cup of coffee or whatever? Hey, that, that looks pretty good, you know, because the millionaires recline beside their swimming pools and they go around their yachts. Why can't I have a bit of that? Why can't I have a lick of that? Every time I turn on the television and watch Star Trek or something, I'm seeing all this modernization. It's good, isn't it? The technical is really good, isn't it? I want to live in a push button world. And we've been tenderized with the drive-ins and with the, you know, the cell phones and, and the whole, you know, post-humanism is rooted in a kind of, a, as you were saying there, a deep wound at the base of consciousness. And even if it wasn't a post-human agenda that we were heading for, something else would have come up. Some, we'd have manifested something else, more wars, you know, so, so it, it's, the, it's, uh, it's an open book. And if you look back in history, even in the last couple of hundred years, Everything you see is is a result of that uh, ancestral trauma. You know, it's the tower struck with lightning and the tarot. Everything man builds will crumble at some point, but then he starts building again because he's not dealing with the underlying roots of what's wrong. So every single edifice, but it's not just post-humanism. It's the medical profession is an obscenity. The media is an obscenity. The courts are an obscenity. The psychiatric is an obscenity, right? Collectivity is a, is, is a you know, if, if you listen to the one of the interviews I did recently with Alex Tassiris, it's like, you know, the, the poor guy doesn't factor in the fact that the collective, the mass itself, is an institution of enslavement. So whether or not you have a school, a, a freaking church, you know, or some corporations or whatever, you think it starts there? As a matter of fact, none of those forces are really that involved in your life. You, you, you can stay separate to them, but can you stay separate to that mass, that herd mind, the hive mentality? That's a whole different story, and that starts with your family. So post-humanism is a lot closer, you see, to, to you than you imagine. Except you're comfortable with it. You sit in front of the big screen TV. You know, it's all push button. And there's something very, very comforting about that. So, uh, you know, they say that affluence is a greater challenge to man's spirituality than poverty. So all these imbeciles running around going, give us more money, you know, and done with the rich. It's like the rich have tests that you don't even know about, you scumbags. You don't even know, you know, if you had money in your pocket, all your socialism would disappear, as it did with your Billy Idols, as it did with the punk movement, and as it did with uh, uh, these uh, leftists and the New Age movement, uh, not New Age movement, New Wave of music in, in Britain, where the you know, communards and uh, Erasure and Depeche Mode and a, a slew of bands, right, started off, waving the hammer and sickle, see when they had a couple of million bucks in their pocket? All of that socialism seemed to just evaporate in their you know, $100,000 synclaviers and sequencers and stuff like that. So it's paper thin. You hand any of these tawdry little uh, Occupy Wall Street guys you know, a million bucks, and they won't be worrying one jot about the, the, the fate of the human race and the people and, the, you know, and all of that. They'll be on their bike. It's so utterly transparent, and it's been proven time and time again that this is the truth. You know, when they're bashing capitalism and trying to blame that, it's such a tawdry, tawdry thing. But all of this kind of hive mentality is part of the problem. It really is. And, and nobody's going to believe me. You pick up the Velikovskys, you read it, you find out what trauma is, how deep it goes, and all of them, the hydra, the incredible inverted tree of life, of all the pathologies, the cocktail of it that comes about from that one rotten seed, you see. And it's called life, it's called existence. And if you can find me, a little oasis of real reality in the middle of all of that, good luck. Yeah, I, it, it's it's an incredible thing to go in back and look at this idea of past trauma. Um, we've got authors like Jack Berenger, Past Shock. I like the name of that book because it talks about how the human race was traumatized at a deep fundamental level that I think a lot of people have difficulty even imagining through the past cataclysms in the past that are recorded all throughout the ancient record. Um, you've got guys like Julian Jaynes and other uh, psychoanalysts and people that have looked into this theory. They might not all agree on how it came to be or what it was that caused it, but they do see that there's a, a deep internal trauma that has happened to the psyche of human beings. 
Um, and then of course we have the trauma throughout all the ages, all the wars, all the, oh my God, it's just every page of history you turn has some sort of trauma in, in it. And then you have the trauma of everybody's just everyday life that they experience. And so you, if you have uh, a, a group of individuals on the planet anywhere at any time that wants to take the reins of power, if they have the knowledge of psychology, mass psychology, and they have this ancient knowledge of what's happened to human beings in the past and what has worked before through various dictatorial regimes and emperors and all these different uh, people we could mention, they have the blueprint then, don't they, to be able to grab control uh, through political or media or um, any of these forms of social control. They have all the skill sets, yet here we are, the average Joe listening to this right now, um, who unless they are read up on these subjects, they don't have those tools. So uh, we had some questions from the chat where people were asking, um, I had someone, let me scroll back up, uh, Lee Veltman was asking, what path would be advised at this point? And Andre Rios was asking, could AI actually be used to unslave our race? I don't know if he meant to say unslave or yeah. enslave, but I mean, what do you think of that? Well, first of all, I just want to make a quick note about Jack Barringer, uh, that little book, Past Shock. I got what I'm talking about from the man. Right, so that was the book that launched it for me. Is that, it was actually just one line in the book, if you can imagine that, but that's how, that's, that's how it happens. So a big kudos to that guy. And then a strange synchronicity, when I did my very first talk on Atlantis, which included a lot of his ideas, he was in the audience and he came up to me at the end. I could not believe it. I've just been recommending his book and saying that everybody better not leave the hall until they bought that book. And just as I'm you know, shutting down the laptop and leaving the stage, this tall man comes over to me, and it's Jack Barringer himself, and he was the sweetest guy you've ever want to meet. Sweet, sweet man. And I was absolutely thrilled about that. But yeah, AI is not the solution because it's based in that old model of the cognitivists, which is that the brain is just a, a firing computer, right? Uh, 3D images are made from 2D images by the optic nerve. Uh, you don't turn the neurons on, they just fire away. And then just in some peculiar state of emergence theory, you know, like in particular conditions, uh, water will turn to ice. Well, yeah, but the, the water wasn't doing it as a conscious thing. So you have consciousness as a kind of an emergence, as kind of a novel uh, epiphenomena of the firing of your neurons. You know, I mean, all this can be dismantled, by the way, in seconds, but they believe this. And also they have to believe it because there's nowhere to go if you don't believe it. These materialists don't have other satellite theories to ride upon, not, not ones that will carry their weight very heavily. So they can't move, whereas other people are flexible and amateur, you know, and outside that academic cage. Uh, they can say, yeah, well, I held that idea for a couple of years, but, you know, I've moved over to this, you know, I moved over from, you know, cognitive science to another kind of, you know, legitimate area. But these hardcore guys can't do that. They have no maneuver, they have no, they have no shoulder room. Once they buy into this hardcore paradigm, to move means to fall off the edge of the world. So they stick there like a bunch of people, you know, like these immigrants sitting on a little boat a little dinghy. They're the most vulnerable idiots there are, right? But because they do occupy that area, they will, uh, they have many ruses of trying to update and upgrade and uppackage their that brand of materialism. And one of the ways that they do it, and all of these ways I'm telling you, you know, I monitor constantly. One of the ways that they do it is by critiquing previous materialists. Like, so when you're sitting on the dinghy and they go, it's not your time to talk. He goes, yeah, and nudge, and off goes the guy who talked before into the water, into the shark-infested, you know, water, where he goes, okay, now let me explain my thing. And then he's knocked off as another good guy gets up and goes, I got a better idea. So they actually assassinate each other as they're revising their work. It's this almost incredible comedy to watch as they desperately hang on to this materialism. So AI is just, you know, uh, the latest upgrade of this bullshit. And see when they, you know, using the word artificial intelligence, it's the perfect term. They, they don't even realize the Freudian slip in that. Yeah, it's artificial. Let, let me put it this way. A computer, which of course we're including the brain here, but any computer image will do, is only programmable. And this is one of their mottos, what I'm gonna say now. It's on their t-shirts, you find it on their desks. You know, no computing without representation. What they mean is that the symbols that you put into a computer so it understands your world are representative, meaning every symbol that you put in, of course, symbol, it can be an individual symbol like A, B, C, D, or just any symbol, but usually it's a collection of uh, O's and ones. We all know this, right? The sequence of binary uh, you know, inputs is, is the symbol in these combinations. So when they put that in, they go, well, that, that, that string you know, represents uh, some problem in the world. 
when, you know, some like the metal fatigue in a bridge, where, you know, we, we got to compute this, right? Or, you know, rockets, uh, what kind of octane do we need? You know, all the problems that they feed into this stuff. But they're doing it based on this very interesting principle, which is the basis of all materialism, which is that those symbols represent the real world. And that's the basis of all materialism and all the what's called computational theory, which then, you know, takes on another life and becomes materialism, becomes Steven Pinker, becomes Richard Dawkins, becomes uh, Sam Harris. They're all, you know, in, in, in this mode, uh, purveying the false theory that the brain is working like this. So uh, the brain uses its own you know, version of this by symbols that represent an allegedly real world. But the trouble with the computational theory is this, and that is, no, the symbols do not represent the real world. The symbols are entering into that device, into that computer. They, they've missed a step, and we've got to nail this like you can't believe. The symbols that are entered into a computer do not represent the real world. They represent the representations of the real world. Right. right. Yeah, there's a there's a step they're trying to pretend, you know, quickly do a dance so that you don't see this. The brain, uh, specifically the left brain, we've talked about this in podcasts, cards of darkness and all of that. The 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 the, re, the a picture that you have of the world that you're looking at, say if I'm looking around now, I think I'm seeing the world. Actually, you're not. You're seeing several, you know, much, uh, edited versions, but they happen so fast that we have a working illusion, right, that what we're seeing is the world. Actually, what you're seeing is a left brain representation of the world. So then if I take a symbol of that world, it is a double representation. So the symbols that you put into the computer that make all computational theory work are not symbols representing a real world. They represent snapshots of a real world. So it's just like taking a Polaroid photograph and then seeing glitches in it, or hey, that lens made that guy look taller than he is, or look at all these specs and artifacts, or look at the way the sun looks blue. So all the computational materialism is not based in what reality really is, whether it has problems or it doesn't have problems. It, it represents manufactured human problems in a manufactured human world. So you see how it's a, serp a serpent eating its own tail? It doesn't have anything to do with the nature of the real world as mystics have portrayed it. And they, they kind of half know that. So then there's the demonization process of demonizing the, 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 mystics, the mystics. That's why this comes about. We're explaining how it happens. Since they half know that they're liars, cheats, and frauds, the only thing they can do is take pot shots at the mystic who keeps pointing their faux pas out and saying that you're, you know, even this goes up to the level of a Murlu Ponty and a Heidegger who knew this, this was bollocks. So it's a representation of a representation. And reality is sort of not in the mix at all. Now, I'm making a very long story short because it has to, this doesn't make sense to people listening unless you understand the dynamics of the left brain in relation to the right brain and then the right brain in relation to, to the world. And that's what the premium, you know, we're going to be, um, be unpacking that in the, in the premium section where I do have the time to go into this. And it's very, very interesting. But just in short, I take a picture of my dog, right? His fur is, uh, you know, blondish, but in the photograph, it looks like it's much darker, like right? brunette. Right. And now I'm uh, I see a problem with the picture. I program my computer to fix what I am telling myself is the dog, the problem of the dog. But it's the it's the picture of the dog. Well, then the, the real dog is not affected one way or the other. In fact, it'd be disaffected if the solution I work with to fix my photograph has no relevance to the, the dog itself. And even if I think I've succeeded, you know, the photograph image, the snapshot got better. And then I even try to apply that rule to the real dog. It might completely go haywire. So it has been going haywire. And that's what's led to the, you know, quant the problems with quantum theory and all sorts of things, uh, models of the mind, the updating of the models of the mind. And the whole thing just is spiraling. And it's a complete and utter mess. But they're hiding it in the ivory towers, in the corridors of power. There's a colossal meltdown in all levels of materialism based on these things that I'm talking about. This is a, you know, one of the major issues that they have. So they're looking for answers and they don't want you to let, they don't want the ordinary person to know that it's going to melt down. And so they've got clever ways of, of smoke and mirrors, you know, to cover this up. And one of the smoke and mirrors is that they wheeled out Stephen Pinker, Sam Harris, to engage who, David? We've already talked about this before. What is the goalposts are moved? I now talk to Bishop such and such. I now talk to Cardinal such and such. I now talk to some pastor 
because that's a fucking sideshow and i don't give a shit about that fucking di dialectic you know and i even i just it's, it's not to do with the real thing because you're engaging a bunch of scarecrows uh, and, and firing pot shots at each other with both of you but both groups are completely fraudulent you know it's one mysteria fighting another mysteria but all the time the real critique you know of this is coming from a ken wilbur coming from an ian mcgillchrist coming from a you know a, a you know, uh, other other parties that are on onto this nightmare, but their voices are not, not no longer heard because the public is focused on. Hmm, yeah, yeah. Uh, could you explain that thing about atheism again? Right. It's an incredible joke, incredible carnival. Because both sides need to come to that table because both sides are on sinking ships, and this is their collusion, and we've fallen for it. Yeah, I agree. Now you were speaking about something very interesting there when you're talking about how with this whole computerized system they're using symbols to interpret symbols to interpret reality you've done a lot of stuff in the past on symbolism and we know that the older version of these cults that are still active in the modern world today a lot of people think they're just dead and gone but i mean nothing could be further from the truth um they are the, the old guard would have used symbols in a religious sense and they still use that and i mean you've done fantastic presentations on sacred symbolism in the media and how they know how to attach to the subconscious mind and uh, pull the right brain in so that you're just buying some friggin toothpaste or something like that and in a political sense they're really good at getting you to buy ideas uh, that are more aligned with their philosophy um, and by them i mean these globalists and these people that are are trying to subvert the the natural order um would this not be in the technological sense also another form of symbolic sorcery in a way like is that if you, you could use an old school term for a modern phenomena or is this just human humanity naturally going down its road discovering technology and just getting out of hand with it you know is it organized uh, or is it just random well it's uh, organized because these these guys in science do know things we don't know and so we're, we're completely victimized by ignorance again right what should be pointed out to the public and mass is what we're talking about right now, but good luck, right? So they're running around in ignorance because the, the boys upstairs know that the, the symbols that we, as you're talking about, includes the whole of language. Just check out how deep this goes, right? And so we don't, when we walk around and speak and talk, we are entrapped in a cage of language. So awe-inspiringly complex and labyrinthine that it, it defies imagination, right? If I say, uh, no, that, that, that painting stinks, you know, well, if, if Mr. Spock was going, he'd go over to the painting and smell it, goes, it doesn't stink. No, it's a metaphor, dummy, right? What? I don't get it, Captain, right? So we live, dummy? What do you mean, dummy? Am I a dummy? Right? You know, it, it's like, oh, the metaphors just spew for, forth. And that, that, that's the symbols we live on, live under. So with all those are the positive, mantic, you know, part of the hermetic tradition to meditate on power symbols, to, you know, do things, to change things. And, and that's certainly something very important. Then you have an artistic treatment of symbols. But the idea is that in, in the more positive treatment of symbols, you kind of know what's going on. You're not, you're not being entrapped by those symbols. You're using them as guides, you see, to certain states. And it's a very free association. But in, in the unconscious realm, You've either got the scientists doing the mistakes that we just said, or you've got the masses unaware that on their spiritual journey, the, the chains that bind them are the, is the very language they speak. And, and, and it's because it's metaphorical. So how do we, how do we explain this further? Um, the, so all language is metaphorical, and we get caught in that trap. It's, it's the left brain's concoction, right? And... We start living in the word, not the thing. So all human beings using language have forgotten the secret key, which is words are not things. Right? When I say the word rose, when I say the word horse, when I say the word oak tree, the word is not the thing. So because we live in urban environments, that was you know, part of the trauma I forgot to mention earlier. Part of the trauma is the, the need to build these hives in which human beings and children then grow up. And you know, AI and post-humanism is closer. But can you believe that one of the houses we build is the house of language? And uh, as Heidegger said, it's chit chat. It's not real sprock. Sprock is something very different. Speech, the real speech, is actually a kind of listening, believe it or not, a kind of silence, which is an extraordinary philosophical uh, you know, teaching. But anyway, leaving that aside, 
Man lives in words, and then he lives inside the word. And then the word becomes a shadow under which he lives, so he doesn't see the thing that the word is representing. So we live inside the world of representations. And then we build a world out of the words. And then the scientist lives within that world and is, again, as I say, making symbols for the world of man's problems, man's issues, man's need to fix a thing, right? Let's program a better washing machine. You know, let's, let's see what's efficient about this and no, non efficient about that. And in the end, you're living in your own incarceration. And, you know, there's, there's a scene in the, the movie Gregory's Girl, you know, by uh, Bill Forsyth, in which the lad gets up in the morning, he's on his way to school, and he comes down. It's a wonderful scene. Uh, and he, he, he comes into the kitchen. And he's, he's got his electric toothbrush going as he comes down the steps in his pajamas. He goes and turns on the coffee machine. He goes and turns on the, the, the mixer to get some orange juice. And before the scene's over, the whole kitchen is buzzing with electronic stuff. And he's perfectly okay. You know, it's all this stuff you just turn on. And it's an electric nightmare. But this is the world. You know, turn on the microwave. Turn on the, the oven, right? It's absolutely hilarious as everything's just shaking and buzzing and bubbling and stuff. You know, noise, noise, noise. So, uh, so then, the, you know, the, the question arises then, if we understand this about language and, all, and the nature of language, it, we have to understand it if we're going to find the still, spot, you know, the still point to get out of this nightmare and there are ways of getting out of it uh, and being aware of it. And uh, not being, you know, be, make sure you're the master of the language and you know that it's just a set of symbols you're using to communicate socially, but it really doesn't have anything to do with reality. We've convinced ourselves that it does, but reality doesn't speak. The universe doesn't talk, animals don't talk, birds sing, animals call and chant and, and howl. That's a form of singing. Wow, right? What? Right. So the right brain has been, you know, completely stifled. It's been it's been caged, it's been silenced, this long shadow that the left brain has cast. And sometimes when you're not looking, it comes back, like for instance, the difference between writing language and then when somebody's talking, you start doodling. Yeah, the right brain is just got a little toe in the door there doodling is the right brain right music is the right brain art is the right brain uh, freudian slips are the right brain walking is the right brain being aware of what your body's doing you're like you're in martial arts is is part of the right brain it's not it's not the worst um walking in nature talk you know uh, observing uh action the whole of action in general is, is an escape from all of this so that we, we've explored all of this and path of the fool and explored a lot of this not all of it but a great deal of it in other work where there are things that you can do to escape these these cages and traps. Um, poetry is also, although poetry uses words, it's using words and returning them back into the real thing. It's it's making you, it's transforming letters into symbols again, you know, like the hieroglyphics. The hieroglyphics are letters, yeah, but they're symbols. And everyone knows, or scholars of this know, that ideograms precede phonograms, right? So all letters actually come from an imagistic point of view first, not vocal not phonograms that's the history of language i'm not making that up so there there are ways out of this nightmare if we you know, are sane enough you know uh, to to observe this kind of thing but until we do then bureaucracy right the corporations we signing on we using words frivolously imagining that they are the thing and not the word we've got to know the difference and then we've got to also do something about it by trying to get in contact with the real so that we escape this gulag of, of words, you know, which the whole world is entrapped in. So uh, it's in, it's incredible when you really get into it, you know. Uh, and me and Adam Burkhardt have done, you know, like snake dance. You know, there's a, there's a whole comment on that in the Doctor Who series and stuff like that. So, you know, I focus on this a great deal to try and uh, show people the beauty of words and what they can do, but also to show you there's quicksand there. We're quagmired, and, and this is a, one of the areas that we're manipulated in. You know, because the right brain doesn't use words. The right brain uses images on a completely different level than the way we would do, you know, when we follow a symbol. Now, ancient man tried to teach us this because if you go back to the earliest caves, you don't see words scrawled on the walls in, in Lascaux. You see what? Symbols. And you see the magician's hands, right? You see the the sage. Remember those, it's at the end of the movie Zardoz that me and Adam worked on the show. So well, why did that? artist you know i don't know how many you're talking almost twenty-five thousand years ago and probably even more why did he paint his hands because he's telling you exactly what i'm telling you now touch the real he's, his hands are on the rocks he's saying touch the real it's it, it, you know it's at the end of zardoz right and 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 there's so much in so much in that you know 
So, uh, yeah, all, or like Heidegger said, all speech dissolves into silence at the end and a, and a kind of listening, a kind of rapport. Now, the people that we're talking about don't want that. So they work with words in a most incredibly sophisticated way by handing you these talismanic things. We talked about Google using that term deep memory, whatever it was. You know, to, like you're saying, to subliminally, right? It's a long winded way of answering your question. They're going to dredge up very important words, words that actually hearken to the right brain. But create a simulacra of right brain ness, if I can use that term. Things we crave, things we want. So the whole study of subliminals is really to see how they taunt us with images and words that actually recall the archaic root of consciousness. And we go for that without actually, oh, wait a minute, oh, that's scorpion. That's, you know, Indiana Jones, don't put your hand in there. There's a lot of scorpions, right? Shit, too late. You're done. So we again, it's an entrapment within words. You know, and, and this is a form of sorcery. It's a Saruman. It's you know, beware his voice, right? Tolkien knew what he was talking about. And so uh, his his elven tongue was a song. Right? There's there's ways to get out of this, but by God, you know, and then the church men know this. So they have their churches built as sanctums of silence. This is just seductive. It's nothing to do with their religion. They know that you need this. So they have the hymns. Right, and they have the chants, right, and the Gregorian chants, and just hymns, because they know how to keep you there. They know what we're talking about, so they know that the power of the word in the beginning was the word. There's nothing more false in the whole of, of the human language or anybody's language than saying in the beginning was the word. It's, it's a bad start right there, and then knowing that they've suppressed all the images, need to smuggle it back. So they, they've done it, as Leonard Slane pointed out, you know, with the, the prohibition against graven images and all, but then they have to bring it back. So they did in the Mariolatry, and they did it in the Dove and the, and the iconography of the Catholic Church. And then even other churches bring it back. I don't care how modern the church is, the, mar, the, the churches are designed as a simulacra of the right brain, you know, and the peace and the tranquility and the listening, and then the hymns and all of that, it's all simulated. But behind it, unfortunately, you know, is devilish stuff. So, you know, it's very, very difficult to, uh, walk and not be entrapped by all of the institutions out there until you start to awaken. So my, my life's work has been to try and help people awaken to the trap. They see it beforehand and warn their children more. Hey, this is all very good. But like Blake said, you know, they're binding my desires with their briars, right? Uh, don't go anywhere near that. It's the black robes. It's, it's, it's Newtonian sleep. Now, another thing to look at, another thing if I can add, is that in order because we lost connectivity with the real, it's out there somewhere, we don't know it because we're too busy in the words. Somebody somehow sublimely understood that we're in an impoverished state. And so William Blake was of the opinion that science is the compensation for the lost wholeness. It's not the lost wholeness, it's not even close, but it is our attempt to simulate, can you believe this? A kind of pre-Vedic rapport or communion with the real that we still hanker for. But they couldn't let us have it because then all systems dissolve. So science, according to him, which he called Newtonian sleep, the single vision, the mind forged manacles, the satanic mills, the looms of Locke, right? John Locke, he's talking about the materialist. And he went at it, you know, he went at this edifice because he knew what it was. And that's the answer, you know, in a long winded way to all of your, anybody's questions listening to us about science. Science is the simulacra to stay, stay here. We're gonna give you back an account of what you're no longer in rapport with. If you've lost your communion, we need to then have high priests who say, no, no, we'll, we'll, we'll create things that simulate what the universe is really about. Here's some stuff about gravity, and here's some stuff about electromagnetism, and here's something about the quantum realm. Isn't it very interesting? And here's some other paradigms. You know, it's really interesting about all of this. You know, and these Matt Prestes are all trying to deconstruct this shit, as, as I am. We all have to do it in our own way, like Walter Russell did it, right? Victor Schauberger, you know, all these people. They're trying to deconstruct that and get you back to the real, to understand. We, go, we give you a theory of light. We'll give you a theory of the uh, Big Bang. That's our favorite one. We love that one, right? Open, open your mouth, shove it in there again, right? So they're giving you a picture of time, a picture of space, a picture of Big Bang, a, a picture of gravity, a picture of whatever it might be, electromagnetism and all the rest of the shit they've been selling us. But, it, well, the universe is aging. You know, it's expanding, it's getting older. And you know something might like an elastic band contract and snap on your face. So just be aware of that, right? So they're going to give you all these paradigms and sign on for it. And they have their high priests to go out there and teach it to you. None of, it, what the fuck? None of it has anything to do with what Tesla, Goethe, Steiner, Schelling, and any of these people were talking about, Whitehead. None of them were, were, were talking about this. None of them. 
They were talking about the rapport, the real rapport, you know, and, and what you find, even Merleau Ponty was talking about that. What you find when you go out there and really touch the real. Science is dead. Science drops like a, a string of rotten banana skins. You're laughing, laughing at that shit. You go, what are you trying to hand me here? So the mystic just sits and goes, so shall it be. You know, I'm an idiot. I'm a fool. So pass me by. I'm mad, like we talked about in The Fool. They don't want to engage these lunatics. So the whole of science, look at Blake's vision, right? He says, I understand what this is. This is the simulacra of that other lost report. And you'll live in it, and you'll chase it around, and you'll decorate it, and you'll paint it. And if you see a crack in it, you'll quickly plaster it. And you will teach your children how to maintain Horizon's gulag. What, what, where was he wrong? No. <laughs> Yeah, wow, that might be one of the best uh, rants I've heard in a while. <laughs> I totally agree. And we had a question I was just going to ask you, and I think you have just answered it, but maybe we can just uh, pointedly answer it. Where Lou is asking, what are your thoughts on the theories that are being discussed right now that reality itself is a type of simulation? I mean, just think it about is. that. There's, there's, well, I mean, I'll let you answer what you think, Michael, but in the way that a lot of these scientists are saying, like it, reality is an illusion. Um, I guess it depends on how we're looking at it. If they're trying to say it's an illusion so that it justifies their materialist paradigm to say, well, it's all just a computer simulation. I mean, how could we have even come up with the language to say it's a computer simulation until we invented computers? And then I mean, now we're prescribing, we're prescribing what we think about computers to reality, which computers are, again, are just symbols, interpreting symbols, interpreting symbols, right? And it's a complete... Um idiocy because uh, even to call it something a simulation implies there's a real thing that is has been simulated right yeah so what's the real then yeah so they don't care about the real so we've already answered it that simulation is true ai is true and we are living in a virtual simulation they made it they made it in the way i just you know described in brief and but not the universe it, itself not the universe itself or nature itself being a simulation oh, no. they're, they're trying to say oh that's also a simulation <laughs> Well, remember, the mind makes reality. So if everybody is conditioned by this mental fallacy, which I call mysteria, yes, then it does, because th that other thing becomes what you want it to become. Uh, Nietzsche said that the, the desire of Christians to make the world ugly and bad makes it ugly and bad. Well, you know, it's the same thing with a postmodernist. If they keep pulling out the struts of culture, you know, in the dark, gnawing away at it, and then they, it's right, then you all collapse down. You'll find yourselves looking around and you go, what is this? And how did it happen? So, you know, uh, the average public is living, the average person in the public is living in the simulation. Every, the media rules their whole life. Everything they buy they, you know, is, is suggested to them by a, a, a ubiquitous media. Everything they think, everything they're told about, you know, white race, uh, racism, ra raciality, who's doing what to whom, you know, is all coming through this. So, you, you know, and even you're reading a newspaper, whatever, you're not really out there in contact with the world in order to really understand realities. And the children are being more and more simulated. So in many ways, you're right, you are living in a virtual reality. And as I said before, the word artificial intelligence completely is accurate. They don't even realize that they're actually, the term they've contacted is what, uh, the term that they've constructed is completely accurate. It is all artificial. The right brain, which is again, just a sort of a euphemism for total consciousness, right? But we have to use these idiotic you know, terminologies, right? Uh, you know, it, it has the bigger picture. Like I said, there's a to there's a real picture of reality, but we're not we don't have access to it. So it's it becomes pointless to talk about. It, it really does, uh, and and uh, you can't talk about because you don't have access to it. And if you did have access to it, you'd fall silent. You know, and, and that's about as far as one can go. There, you know, I've, I've, I've sketched that whole thing out in my books. You know, to to point out, and in the next. In the, in, the broad, in, the, in the program I'm just about to upload, you know, we go into this in uh, bigger detail, trying to explore what the principles of mysticism are. Because if you take on board everything I've just said, then surely these kinds of arch criminals and propagandists couldn't possibly be relied upon to give you an accurate definition of what mysticism is, since their whole career is based in dissing it, dissing Hegel, dissing Schelling, dissing Whitehead and all of these people. Well, then why are we looking to them 
Why don't we question that maybe their interpretation of mysticism and idealism is false from the start? It's a misrepresentation. And so we keep hearing about a misrepresentation of a philosophy that we have never actually gone and studied. So isn't it time to go and study it then to find out what it really is in itself? Well, I specialize in those guys as well. So, you know, these 30 years of research now will be presented there to say, in a nutshell, you know, here's some theories. Here, let's explore the central pillars of mysticism, you know, truth or falsity, and see if they stand up. Because if they do, if it turns out that the people watching that program turn out that they believe, like I do, that these principles do stand up, materialism is in real prob has a real problem on its hands. And more than that, you will now, when you embody these teachings, not as misrepresented you know, mysticism, but the real thing, then you can stand up to one of these Stephen Pinkers online or in face, like I can. I can stand up to these uh, you know, types, these Dawkins, and undermine them, not, not, not throwing at them something from the outside, going into where their own teachings are and finding the flaws and shutting them up. You know, as as we've done on several podcasts and through the path of the fool, showing showing the you know the proofs of mysticism. You know, like that one we talked about dreams. I think it was with uh, Scott Onstott. He went into the you know the, the mind's ability to objectify itself in dreams and so on. And there's plenty of other anecdotes like that that these guys don't want to cover. And then there's this one about metaphorical language. You know, I'm going to be now really uh, ramping up this whole thing because this is a hydra that seems to come back no matter how times we cut it to pieces. And so we have to come back again. Uh, you know, and find the silver bullet that takes these guys down. That's of paramount importance to me because there's millions of dollars behind them. They're stepping up their game. They're going to move forward. They're, they're moving, inching towards this post-human nightmare. We've got to be able to deconstruct it. And, and you know, I've just shared some of the ways, you know, a little sketch there of uh, what they're planning and, and some suggestions about what we can do about it. But we have to be able to take these people down, not in some inarticulate rant about some God and Christianity. That doesn't work. They love that. Don't you see the insider smiles on their face? Because they've got they've got their little code book and you've got your little code book and go, you know, and they're fighting each other just like that. That's worthless. I knew it was worthless back in the 80s when I saw these debates. What are you debating? It's like you're shaking hands, you know, afterwards, giving each other big hugs. It's all made for TV, for Christ's sake. Not, there's no real dialogue about anything that's really real philosophically. They're leaving out those people. I read material, the books of these materialist guys all the time. They don't mention half the people we do. Right, because yeah, of course they can. It's an act of duplicity. They'll only mention the mystics who are weak in their mysticism, you know, unworked mystics, good, good, well-meaning people, but they haven't really fleshed out the thing. They go after them like a bunch of vultures because you know that they haven't thought it out properly. But you won't go to an Owen Barfield, and you won't go to a Shelling, and you won't go to the people who have worked it out strongly. You'll avoid them like a plague and go to some weaker, you know, uh, victims. And and that's scurrilous. That is. That's really scurrilous. They won't take on a Kostler. They won't take on a Wilbur. They won't take on the people who really know their shit. You know, and uh, and also I specialize in books from people within their rotten coterie who have jump ship, who are way ahead of them. And like, you know, the rats leaving the sinking ship. There's been eminent, eminent men who, who've already left, already said this materialism is bankrupt. Yeah, but has anybody heard of them? You know, well, so, you know, I specialize in that. And, and now's the time I, we've got a platform now, finally, because remember, if you go on somebody else's podcast, good luck trying to, you know, get this shit out. So you ha we have to be able to do it on our own and we will. And, and this is the perfect platform to really dip into it so that, you know, there's a, a, a much more crash course needed because it's getting pretty desperate. You know, and the Jordan Petersons and all these people, you know, God love them. They do good work, but they can only take you so far. They're, they're institutionalized themselves to a degree. And even though you give them always a couple of stars because they're insiders, it's very, very important. I've said that in all my work that, you know, my message is to the insiders to step up and he, he's doing that. And that's a good, uh, you know, good image and a model for everybody from the, in, from, the, from the inside. But don't ever then mistake, you know, just become a cult sitting around him. There's, there's Alan Watts, you know, there's Paul Tillich, there's Martin Heidegger, Merle Ponty, there's men of eminence. You can't even imagine how much eminence it dwarfs his knowledge. Get on with it. Get on with it. Get to your author Kostlers and get to your, you know, your uh, Ken Wilbers and all these other people that I, I mentioned. There's a lot of homework to be done. Well, and speaking of homework, and uh, we unfortunately have about another 10 minutes. We originally wanted this to go longer, but we had to start late. And just so you know, for those that are tuning in, Michael and I are going to be doing these more often. Um, we would love to have more time to just go through and all the questions. And it's funny, as I'm watching the questions, 
it's interesting that Michael is answering them as they're being asked because uh, with what, what you've been saying, I think that clears up a lot of people's questions. If you go back and watch it, just think about what Michael's been saying and I'm pretty sure it's going to address a lot of it. Some people were wanting you to get into like flat earth and all that kind of stuff. I think that's for another day. I think uh, there's so many different ways that the human mind uh, living in and being raised in this artificial environment is going to construct all kinds of variations of this mysteria. And you're going to see that constantly. And you know what it is? If we, if we look at it from a positive perspective and say that it's actually a crying out from human beings to, to want something real. And they're so disgusted with the simulation and the artificiality of their lives that they're looking anywhere they possibly can. Unfortunately, we end up looking a lot of times in the wrong places, but we're looking somewhere for something real. And I think this reflects the, you know, looking at the depression and the suicide statistics and the state of decay in people's emotional and psychological health. This is huge. Um, so if you if you have a couple points to wrap up with, Michael, we'll do that. But then also mention this new premium series that you're going to be doing on Unslave. This is something that's awesome. We've been wanting to do this for a while. Uh, we finally have the technology. So uh, just maybe a few words about what you're going to be doing in that series for premium members on Unslaved. It'll be exclusive research just for them. And then uh, a few finishing thoughts on some of these points for people. Yeah, it's uh, going to be the top drawer stuff that, you know, it just wasn't the right platform. It just wasn't the right platform. So now we've got it. Uh, it had to be good audio. It had to be good video. It had to, you know, have slides and, and references, good references and all of that this work that's been on you know on the shelf for such a long time so that will be coming out there's going to be stuff on philosophy and lots of different kinds of subjects again my favorite subject is bringing famous names uh the, the lost names you know the wilhelm reichs the arthur Yanovs, the alice millers the Otto ronks uh you know the wilhelm reichs will be looking at their work um uh in a similar way that we looked at blavatsky and crowley you know they're not wearing the t-shirts but you know let's come back to sanity bill and and uh, look at uh, these these people you know you're looking at nietzsche you'll find some some of the most beautiful stuff there as well as the most horrid you're looking at uh, any of these philosophers you'll you'll find stuff that's just ridiculous and repulsive but there's great gems in there as well you know uh, but it's very hard to get that point across for some reason you know no matter how many times you said like say for instance about crowley you know uh, some of the fictional works that he wrote were so god awful you know, I mean, yeah, I'm the first to admit, but then he wrote some fiction that was absolutely, mo mo you know, monumental. So uh, it's just so hard to break people's prejudices. You know, they're caught in these various uh, limited, limited, narrow paradigms. And see, the good thing about myself is I'm not, I'm very flexible. You know, I know I'm a student unfolding more than some sort of teacher. I am myself learning all the time and therefore not being in a fixed, path or trajectory i can make changes i've left it so that you know i can make even u-turns in, in the subject matter but i think that's a virtue because if you look around at some of the other people especially now that you know mr trump is president and you look at all of the uh, the nightmare list of your liberal leftists you know with are meant to be in the alt research community which started off very conservative and now is almost rabid communist how did how is that these, there's speakers, you know, in this movement who are card carrying, uh, you know, fans of, of Corbyn and, and this kind of thing. You know, what, what the hell is going on here? You see? So what's going on here is partly that they have a rigid mindset, right, which is endorsed by the collective or the, or the culture in which they grew up. And they've just stuck to that rigid, rigid paradigm because they haven't read anybody else, you know, and I have. So one of the things I do is I keep very flexible. And then I might go down this road and I may turn back again. I may go you know, three, four times, but that's what knowledge is all about. The other kind of person, and I, I refer to these people, some of these people in the Refuting the Refuters article, although there I'm mostly talking about fundamental you know, Christians, but the same rule applies to everybody else. They want to territorialize knowledge, right? They literally want to urinate on the lamppost and say, this is mine and it's never going to change. You know, you guys get away. That's not knowledge. You don't own anything. You don't own any of the knowledge. All you own is the curiosity. And if you're really curious, you do go and see what's down that road. And you do drive down there. And you do go up here. And you do look at things from a different perspective, like in the movie, you know, Dead Poet Society. Get on top of your desks. Do a handstand. Look at the world differently every single day. So I'm in this movement. I'm in an occult 
society, you know, world, in a, an occult uh, paradigm. How dare you come along and tell me I've upset you now because I've, I've thrown over, you know, or turned over, you know, ripped out a couple of the pages or, you know, saw some, some, something slightly different about world affairs. How dare you? Get lost. Go back and, you know, go back and, uh, you know, flip some burgers or something. Go back and turn on Radio 1. You'll love it. Because you, what are you doing in my world? I'm doing what this world is all about. I'm doing what the man in this movement should be doing. I'm the poster child for it. I'm doing what the manual says. You are the people are the imposters. You're the gate crashers coming in here with your rigid minds and your dirty boots from the world of academia and, and common sense. Go back to that world and have done with it. Don't come up here, you know, trying to put your Morris Minor engine in my Ferrari, you fuckers. Uh, that's priceless, man. I feel your pain. Um, well, thanks, Michael. I mean, uh, I think we should do this a, a little bit more often here. We can get on and grab some questions. We've always got people messaging us and I want to just say, I've, I appreciate it. We've got a really amazing chat going on here. Some, um, excellent discussions, some questions, some conversations. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in and Michael taking the time, um, today, uh, despite all the frustrating technical things, what we had to deal with, but, uh, We've got it all sorted now. So um, lots coming up. We have a fantastic episode of Unslave coming out on Sunday. Uh, maybe just let people know quickly about that. We're, we're interviewing somebody who's coming from the world of Asa True. Is that correct? Yeah, the Asa, Asa True. Asa True, it's just a, you know, the, 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 a revival of, and, and this is what we're talking about, a revival of the earlier ways. Remember I said there's certain ways out of the labyrinth of language certain ways out of the paradigm in order to get in touch with the real again. Find your way, you know, like in the movie Following, you know, where a trauma breaks him through. Right? A guy has a traumatic event and he's, he's back. He's back. And the wife can handle it and the system can handle it. His mates can handle it, but he's, he's in the still point, right? Just like Doctor Who, you know, in the snake dance. So, all sat through is sort of a, a well-meaning revival, a moderate, it's very moderate, uh, return to some of the Western, Northwestern traditions of the Druids. That's why I'm interested in, of course, uh, the Nordic uh, mysticism, because here we, we've been talking mostly in this, in this uh, you know, conversation about um, mysticism. But there's different kinds of mysticism. Not all are good, and some are very, very pure. So this is a, you know, we'll be talking to uh, Matt Flavel there about that tradition and how it impacts uh, the world and how much Christianity and even Judaism has plagiarized it and you know, borrowed huge chunks. The Merovingians did. Did you know that two of, at least two of the kings of the Merovingians were tutored by monks in Ireland, you see? And those monks, although Christian, were very much uh, the archivists and cannibalizers of the great Druidic tradition. So uh, there's a case to be made for this return to roots. Uh, of all peoples, you know, we'll be looking at this in a, you know, from a Nordic perspective. But all peoples need to go back to their roots because if you, if everybody goes back to their roots, those roots actually, can, can you believe it, lead to a common gnosis. So I don't care if you're from New Zealand, China, Outer Mongolia, right, Terra del Fuego, or Iceland. The real meaning of the word Gnostic, which has been so abused to mean, you know, off-world realities and, and this world being a cage of souls no no gnosis is simply the uh, the core of any subject you're studying that's being preserved and hasn't been contaminated so an osa through is a sort of a worship a veneration and a reverence for nature and, and other other aspects that is to be found in the you know in, in africa to be found in india amongst the brahmins and others right and and the corruption of it is then where we're at right now so it'll be interesting to get an, a, an understanding of uh these original archaic uh, practices and rites. And then what we can do is also then say, yeah, a bunch of this stuff I can actually translate into my worships of the year, you know, because there's, there's certain feast days which co correspond with certain constellational astrological phenomena. You know, when certain stars rise and set, I should be, you know, I should be aware of this kind of thing, the lunar cycle, you know, and there's a whole thing, bunch of stuff we can get into there. Uh, art, pottery, leather making, you know, working with animals in a different way. And so also true, I believe, is a very, very uh, you know, legitimate and extremely positive response to the extreme mechanization, the extreme uh, dumbing down, 
and the extreme is the incarceration in the city environment. And so if the, we need to factor that in. You know, it may not interest all of our listeners, but you know, people who have a, coming from a Western tradition um, and from a kind of a West Northwestern uh, roots, you know, Scots Irish, Scandinavian, whatever, you know, they can tune in. But as I said, if you follow that tradition to its roots, you'll find yourself. You know, it's like I think it was Nazim Haramein had said that you know we're all standing on the on, on the surface of the earth, right? But all our feet, right? If you draw the lines, they all they all merge at the center of the earth. But our heads separate. So take your pick, what you want. So any of the great traditions that you know point you down, point you to the earth, point you to the fundamentals and the roots. There's nothing wrong with that. And in the end, it's not this oneness of Benetton and Google that I'm talking about. No, you're you're doing it through the thread of your tradition. But you will have a handshake for all those other sages who've done the same thing. Doesn't mean you negate and just it's a big mud, a big a heap of shards courtesy of the World Bank and George Soros's your wet dream. No, you're doing it through the spoke, the road, the avenue of your cultural, right? Your blood, blood and soil in, in, in the true way. The Nazis just co-opted all of this stuff and, and demonized it. But there's there's great, great traditions there, you see. And it, I can prove it because Odin, for one thing, becomes the uh, Adonai of the Phoenicians, who becomes the Adon of the Jews, and that's Jehovah. Right? His other name is Adonai, but that comes from Donar or Adon or Odin. Right? There's an incredible tradition there. Uh, Thor is Arthur. King Arthur is Athor, right? which is Scandinavian. And you have the various versions of that way, way over in the Far East, you know, with Indra in India, in these, these uh, Vedic and uh, Aryan teachings. So there's an incredible exploration there of the sacred mountain, the sacred tree. The real meaning of the zodiac and a million and one things we can get into with our next guest. I hope you can. Well, I'm very much looking forward to it myself, and I think it's going to be great. This is awesome. I really enjoyed this. Uh, a quick little live video for you guys. Uh, thanks to everybody for supporting the channel. Um, thanks for supporting Unslaved. Come and check us out. We got a lot of content coming your way, and uh, Michael is going to be releasing uh, very soon his first premium episode for premium members of Unslaved. Uh, that'll include all of the sources that he was talking about. And essentially, you'll be going on the research journey with Michael as he continues to go and uh, look oh, into and, uh, these matters. Go ahead. Oh, let me also say a personal thanks because that premium section is made possible by all of you listening. And that is not lost on me at all. We haven't had the opportunity to do it before. So this is uh, my gift back to you from your gift to me. So again, a personal, great you know, thanks to every one of you for supporting Unslaved in the last year because you know now your the payback is on its way you know with, with some top drawer material oh and i second that second. i second that for sure so well that's all the time we got today ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for tuning in we'll be back here again soon and we will see you on sunday so have a good one guys cheers